as I said last week, we're starting a new series today, looking in 1 Peter. So if you want to open your Bible or turn on your iPad or your phone or whatever it is you've got the word on, or just listen, we're starting in 1 Peter and chapter 1. And I'm just going to read two verses there. One Peter one verse one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered through throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Peter's one of the most prominent of the New Testament apostles, perhaps second only to Paul, about whom, of course, we have many biographical details in Acts and in his letters. But in contrast, Peter pops up from time to time, firstly in the Gospels, then in Acts. And those incidents reveal something of his character, and it's this Peter that we're going to be considering this morning. His name was actually Simon Barjona, but it was Jesus who gave him the name Peter when he first encountered him. And we read about this at the beginning of, of John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 42, where Peter encounters Jesus, and Jesus gives him that name after Andrew, Peter's brother, has brought him to meet Jesus. And we see the name reinforced again in that wonderful passage in Matthew 16, where Peter declares, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you are Peter, and he affirms the name again because Peter is demonstrating some of the qualities that will show themselves more fully after the day of Pentecost when Peter becomes the spokesman and leader of the early church. By trade, of course, Peter was a fisherman. And in Matthew 4:19, we have the promise of Jesus that Peter would become a fisher of men. And we see that again worked out through, the, through, the, uh, through Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and through the rest of the New Testament. And from the time of the stoning of Stephen and the persecution of the church that followed, we see Peter moving away from Jerusalem, gradually getting further and further away, until he ends up in Rome. He was in, uh, in Acts 9, he was traveling around the countryside within Judea and arrived at Lydda, which is modern day, in modern day Tel Aviv. In Acts 10, we see he was in Caesarea. Paul has him in Antioch at the same time as him at some stage, according to Galatians 2.11. And then 1 Peter is addressed to the churches of southern Turkey, modern-day southern Turkey, with whom presumably he had some relationship. And so by the early 60s AD, we know he was in Rome. And it was from Rome that this letter was written to encourage the church across the region, which, as I say, is today southern Turkey. And despite him traveling around in the Gentile world, his primary mission was to the Jews, just as Paul's primary mission was to the Gentiles. However, whilst First Peter has many specific references to the Jews, such as calling them Sarah's children in chapter 3, verse 16, it's clear that the letter is addressed to both Jews and Gentiles, Gentile believers alike. And so there's much that we can learn as we go through this letter that Paul wants to, sorry, Peter wants to tell the church, impart the church to the church, encourage the church with, and just remind them of the truth so that they can stand strong, particularly in the face of coming persecution. And persecution crops up in a number of places throughout the letter. But we encounter this man, Peter, as a flawed man, but one through whom God performed mighty acts. He, alongside James and John, were part of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. It's he who is willing to go out on a limb, walking on the water. You remember Jesus said, come, and he's walking across the water, and then he starts to realize that what he's doing, and he sinks. How often do we sink when we realize what we're doing? Who, who else suffers from imposter syndrome? Or well, it's him who states clearly who he thought Jesus is. You are the Christ. He got it and was willing to, to go out on a limb there. On the other hand, we also see his failures, trying to stop Jesus going to the cross, for which he received the rebuke, get behind me, Satan, which of us would be happy to receive that rebuke from Jesus. He put his foot in it on the Mount of Transfiguration, Lord, I'll build you some tents, 
shut up, Peter, basically is what God says back to him. He promises to go and even die with Jesus in Jerusalem and then denies him three times. Three times he denied that he even knew Jesus. He was a hypocrite later on in Antioch, we find, when, when the, the, he ceased to, to eat with the Gentiles, when the men from James turned up and Paul had to rebuke him. But we also see Jesus' great love for him in John 21, when Jesus restores him and reaffirms him. Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. And Jesus, for the three rebukes, sorry, the three denials that Peter had made, three times Jesus affirms him back in his ministry. Jesus never gives up on any of us. There is always redemption. There is always restoration. And we see that with Peter. On the other hand, as well, we see great things happen through him. In Acts 2, he preached the first post-resurrection sermon that saw 3,000 saved in one go. We see him performing many signs and wonders, we're told, in Acts 2.43, including healing a man born, born lame at the beautiful gate, praying for the release of the Spirit on the Samaritan believers, being rescued from prison by an angel when Herod tried to have him killed. And then in Acts 12, 7 to 10, uh, sorry, in Acts 12, 7 to 10, and then it was also Peter in Caesarea through whom the gospel start, first moved out from being an exclusively Jewish message to being received by the Gentiles. He also remained bold in speaking out in the face of the persecution of the Jewish authorities against the church in Acts 4 and in leading the church to pray in the face of such persecution. And, and it, we're told that when he prayed, the building shook. He was a man who knew his God. And even though he made mistakes, God used him powerfully and mightily. He also spoke up in Paul's defense when uh, there was the first ecumenical council in Acts 15, despite earlier agree disagreeing with Paul. Scripture doesn't pull any punches with regard to Peter presents him to us, warts and all. And this is very reassuring for us lesser mortals. It tells us that God can use anyone, any one of us, despite our shortcomings. What he looks for is a heart that's willing, a heart that is surrendered, a heart that is committed. And even though we might mess up from time to time, he is still with us. As we've already said, 1 Peter is written from Rome, which he refers to in the, in the letter in chapter 5, verse 13, as Babylon. And that was a code name for Rome at the time because they equated it with the evils of the past Babylon. And it's believed by most scholars that this was written around early 60s AD, just before Nero's persecutions. But the backdrop to the letter is in circumstances where Christians are beginning to be ostracized. In most cities, if a person didn't take, make tribute to the local gods, they were thought to be working against the city and were therefore held in suspicion. The church is also held in suspicion in our nation in this day. Of course, this included the Christians, and so by the time they were beginning to be shunned, by this time they were beginning to be shunned by both Jews and Gentiles. In AD 64, of course, Nero blamed the Christians for the fire that destroyed most of Rome. And this started the first wave of persecutions against the church, which then continued for the next 250 years. Church tradition tells us, and Eusebius wrote about this, that Peter was executed in this first wave and that not deeming himself worthy to be crucified in the same way as his Lord, he was crucified upside down. The place where he was crucified was at the racetrack in Rome. And in the centre of a racetrack was an, is an obelisk, was an obelisk. And it still stands in the middle of St. Peter's Square today. And on my every, almost every time I go to Rome, I go to that obelisk because I know that's probably one of the last things that Peter saw. And it's like reaching out to touch this man. There's a body in the crypt at St. Peter's in Rome. And it was exhumed in the late 1960s 
It was found to belong to a Jewish man from the first century. What was odd about it was that the feet were missing. And speculation has suggested that the feet would have been cut off to get the body down from the cross quickly by the Christians before the dogs came to feast on his remains. So there's a very good chance that that is Peter's body in the crypt at St. Peter's in Rome. Think about that if you ever get there. As we've already said, this letter was written to believers, both Jews and Gentile, in what is today southern Turkey. And the letter contains a mix of exhortation and consolation. It was written to exhort the Christians in Asia Minor to maintain their faith in the midst of social scorn, shaming, slander and stigma. Peter encouraged believers to hold fast. And in this day, we too need to be believers who hold fast to what we believe. Reminding them, he does, that their identity is in Christ. They may be disparaged by neighbours, but in God's eyes they are precious, royal and holy. They have experienced new birth, purification and redemption. They look forward to a future salvation with an imperishable inheritance. And in this, Jesus is their supreme example. So we come now to the verses that we just read. Peter begins the letter by identifying himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And this is, establishes both his identity and his authority. He is one of those who specifically Jesus chose to, and sent out to proclaim the good news, because the word apostle means sent one. And we know that, where, that there were other apostles other than the twelve, Paul and Apollos traveling around the churches as well as others. In fact, the Didache, which is the first handbook on how to do church that the apostles wrote, instructs the church how to receive apostles. Peter, however, would have been widely known amongst the churches, as the stories of the life of Jesus in the early church circulated widely. And so, having established himself as an apostle, he directs them as God's elect, and he identifies them as chosen. And these are both terms that prior to Pentecost were specifically used of Israel. It was God who chose Abraham and elected him to be the bearer of the promise that was to result in all the families of the world being blessed. And it was from the life of Abraham that Israel were chosen to be the light of the nations. And it's into this line that the new covenant people are now incorporated. So just as Abraham was chosen, so we are chosen. You're chosen. Tony, you're chosen. Chris, you're chosen. Everyone here is chosen according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and he gives the purpose for which this takes place you're chosen to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood let's consider these things for a moment first God's foreknowledge God knew you before you were born and he knew what decisions you would make throughout your life and out of his foreknowledge, he chose you to become part of his people. None of us can or has done anything to deserve that choosing. None of us can merit it. And Peter will elaborate this on this in the next chapter when he designates his audience a chosen race. But knowing that we are chosen by God tells us what an amazing privilege that we have. You could say, why did God choose me and not someone else? However, we could say the same about Abraham. Why did God choose Abraham? And it's at this point I believe we have to leave it to the inscrutable wisdom of God. I don't know why God chose me, but I'm grateful that he did. And the other thing to avoid in this is to uh, deciding for ourselves who is and isn't chosen. Our responsibility is just to preach the good news. And it's God who will choose who he, whom he will choose. Just thank God that he's called you to himself and poured out upon you all the blessings of salvation. Secondly, we're told we're chosen through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And sanctification has to do with being set apart, made right for service. Something of that came through in the prophetic word this morning. And for each one of us, the work of the Spirit within us prepares us to be useful for God. God has a purpose for each and every person in this room every one of us he has tasks that only we can fulfill and he's chosen us to do those things that he's already prepared for us to do some of us may have some natural gifting but it's the holy spirit who does the work with us to make us ready to do those things that god has for us 
He's the one who cleans us up and trains us so that we can live as Christians in this world. For each one of us, if we're to fulfill what God has for us, we need to engage with the Holy Spirit. We need to open up ourselves to him so that he can do his work in our lives and then we can do what we are called to do. And this leads to the next point. This calling is for obedience. We're not caught born again to live selfish lives, but to live as Jesus has called us to live and do the things he wants us to do and to say the things he wants us to say to those he wants them, us to say them to. Our calling is not to sit on a bus with our ticket in our hand waiting to get to heaven. Our calling is to live as Jesus instructs us, instructs us to live and to be his agents, his ambassadors in this world. Peter describes us as exiles. That means we're living in this old world whilst we're citizens of the new world that is coming, the kingdom of God. And so we're strangers in a strange land, but we live with the knowledge that the kingdom is coming, that Jesus is coming back, and he will have this world filled with his glory. Our calling, therefore, is to live as citizens of the kingdom that's coming while existing in this old world, which is awaiting its renewal. Finally, he says, we are sprinkled with his blood. And this is a reference back to the sacrificial system and specifically the Day of Atonement because the blood was always associated with cleansing. And you and I are cleansed from our wrongdoing because Jesus' blood has been shed. He's paid in full the penalty that our sin required. And as a result, we're now clean. No more guilt, no more shame, no more need to revisit our past wrongdoings, no more need to live in condemnation. We are made clean because of the cross. You are clean this morning if you trust in Jesus Christ and in his blood. And this all leads us to, into his opening great greeting. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. You and I have already received an abundance of grace and peace. And his graces are made available to us all. And we're granted, as a result, God's peace. May God pour out upon us all much of his grace and peace in the days to come. And now let us celebrate what Jesus has done in giving us that grace and peace.